Miss the X to the Z exhibit. What's up, guys? It's Andy Purcell. This is your boy, Brown Monk. This is Ryan Serhan. This is Shingy. Hi, it's Patrick McDivitt. Sonia Sarvitani. This is Director X. Hey, everybody, I'm Forbes Riley. Yo, this is Goldie. This is Amberly Lago. This is Chris Voss. Michael Francis here. Yo, this is Charlie Tuna. Hey, what's up? It's Billy G. And you're listening to the Run GPG podcast. Well, I'm going to go hang out and listen to David's next podcast from the Run GPG. You might hear something you like. Peace. Tom Wheelwright, CPA, is the visionary and best-selling author behind multiple companies that specialize in wealth and tax strategy. Tom is also a leading expert and published author on partnerships and corporation tax strategies, a well-known platform speaker, and a wealth education innovator. Tom is a regular commentator and contributor to publications such as Forbes, The Huffington Post, ABC News, and more. He's also trusted as the personal accountant and business partner of Robert Kiyosaki, who we know as the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'm looking forward to this discussion today. Tom, welcome to the Run GPG podcast. Thanks, David. It's great to be here with you. Um, as I was saying earlier, you know, on the show, we do have, uh, you know, entertainers, influencers, business builders, entrepreneurs, and they have these, you know, these lengthy, elaborate uh, bios when we go through them. Uh, yours is more simple when it could be much more complex considering the subject material, right? Uh, but then I take a look at your, your website and your mission statement says, my goal in life is to make taxes fun, easy, and understandable. Uh, I really love that. Uh, it's such a refreshing uh, take on something that can be complex and stressful. So the first question, Tom, again, <laughs> did you see a need to make taxes simple and fun? You know, um, Albert Einstein's quoted as saying that the most difficult thing in the world to understand is income tax. And I, but he's also quoted as saying any six year old can explain something to a genius, but it takes a genius to explain something to a six year old. And so, you know, I love I love taxes. I love the tax. I've been doing this for 40 odd years. And to me, what would be more challenging than to take the literally Albert Einstein says the most complex subject in the world and make it simple. And, uh, you know, I say uh, simple and fun. Um, I can actually prove it's fun. Um, if you've ever received a refund and you look right in the middle of that word refund is fun. So we love refunds. Uh, so that's, that's how I can prove that taxes can be fun. When, when it's a refund, it's, it's fun. That's when it gets exciting. <laughs> that's incredible. I, uh, I never thought of that. That's uh, you learn something new. It does say fun in that word. Um, so yeah, like, how do you do that? Like, what's the process? Like wealth is, you know, when we talk about receiving a, you know, a dividend, uh, you know, a refund that is fun, but how do you make taxes fun? Like, how do you approach that? Well, 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 first of all, you have to really look at what's the tax law really all about, mm -hmm. right? Because everybody's afraid of it, just like they're afraid of finance, right? People are afraid of finance. That's why they turn the money over to wall street. Um, that's a mistake too, but people are afraid of taxes. And so they go, well, I'm just going to let my guy handle that. Or I'm going to let my, you know, my CPA handle that or, or my, my CA or whoever is going to handle that. I'm going to let them handle it. And I'm going, well, what if you actually understood how the tax law really works? Um, and rather than being this onerous, um, way that the government raises revenue, the, the first thing we have to realize with tax law is that it's fundamentally a bunch of incentives. Mm -hmm. And that's all it is. I mean, literally, there is one line that says all income's taxable unless we say it isn't. Another one says nothing's deductible unless say it is. And most of the rest of in the US, it's about 6,000 pages. In Canada, it's about half that. In Great Britain, it's twice that. Um, most of the rest of the law is really just a series of instructions about how to reduce your taxes. And so once you see it for what it really is, and this is, you know, the government's way to control the economy, control investment, to encourage investment. Once you see it from that, all of a sudden, you know, the light can go on. You go, wait a minute. Uh, I like the idea of a roadmap to reduce my taxes. I don't like the idea of somebody coming to collect taxes. So let's get into the theory a little bit then, if that's okay. Um, I I've heard you say that, um, you know, no matter your income, you can legally pay no taxes without cheating. Yeah. Can you break that down for us? Maybe just unpack that a bit. Yeah. So, okay. Let me, let me give you some simple examples. Um, when you think about what does the government want to have done, right? So the government says, well, look, if you buy a home 
that's a good thing. If you rent a home, that's not as good thing. Okay. So if you buy a home, we're going to give you a tax deduction, but if you rent a home, we're not. So what's the government saying? The government's saying, go buy a home. We'll give you a tax break if you buy a home. The government says, look, if you hire employees, we'll give you tax breaks. If you are an employee, we don't give you tax breaks. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the IRS wants you to hire employees. It tells you want, yeah, they, they want you to create jobs. So really the key is just look at what is your government, it doesn't matter what country you're in, what does your government want done and do it. <laughs> and, and chances are there's a tax incentive behind it. I mean, this started in the 50s. Um, president Kennedy was the first uh, U.S. president to really hone in on the use of tax incentives as a way to encourage certain economic activity. And every president since then, uh, and every leader around the world has done it since then. So I've, you know, I've traveled with Robert to uh, 30 countries, um, all six, you know, six continents. And I always look at the tax law before I go or while I'm going, right? Okay, what's the tax law in um, the UK? What's the tax law in Romania? What's the tax law in Australia? It's, they're remarkably similar. Actually, my new book, uh, we actually look at 15 different countries and analyze the, the, the incentives between 15 different countries. And what we find universally is that once you kind of key on, on, all right, what are the government's priorities? Then now all we have to do is say, well, look, if we invest that way, we'll get tax breaks. And one of the really simple ways, you know, I like to make it easy. Yes. So one of the simple ways to think about it is the more money I make, the more tax I pay. The more assets I build, the less tax I pay. Because the government wants you to build wealth, not earn income. That's the incentive. The incentive is to actually build wealth. There's a disincentive to earn money. Very interesting. Uh, I love that breakdown. That is very simple. I guess when you look at the broad stroke of what governments are trying to accomplish, the rules uh, and the, are inside of those, right, is kind of what I'm hearing here. But what do you say to people who say, you can't do that? Only the rich who have teams of accountants can figure out ways not to pay taxes. What do you say to those people? Well, I, I, I say you, you need to turn that inwards and say, no, you can't do that. I can do that, but you can't. OK, it, it, what I would say is, you know, if you're not willing to learn, if you're not willing to grow, if you're not willing to discover, then you're right. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody's doing it. Right. So the rich do it because they don't have to learn it because they do have these legions of accountants and, and attorneys and so forth that are working on it for them. And uh, I, I work for some of those people, <laughs> but the average person can do it if they simply understand how the tax law works. And, and really, you kind of have to simplify it. So basically what I do is I always look for patterns. Right. How can we predict the weather? Because we understand weather patterns. Right. So how can I predict that somebody can get to zero in tax? Well, I understand the tax patterns. So all I'm trying to do is explain the patterns. Here's how the patterns work. Follow the patterns and don't pay any tax. The, the rule, at least in the United States. So we, in, in, the U.S. Constitution says we have an equal protection clause in the Constitution, which says that you can't just benefit one group of people. You have to benefit everybody equally. Okay. What that means is that you can't make a tax law that applies to one group of people that doesn't apply to everybody who's in that exact same situation. So if you take a business owner, whether you're um, just starting out or whether you're Elon Musk, okay, you've got the same laws available to you. The question is, are you willing to learn those, you know, what those laws are and are you willing to apply those laws to your situation? Elon Musk is, Jeff Bezos is, a lot of people aren't. I actually find, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the rich cheat, right? Now, I actually don't find that. I find that it's primarily the small business owner that cheats. And I think it's because they don't know how to reduce their taxes otherwise. Um, if you knew how to reduce your taxes legally, you do it legally. And uh, if you knew that what you were doing was something the government wanted done, then you wouldn't feel guilty about it either. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not talking about loopholes here. Are there loopholes? Absolutely. Those are unintentional. Do the rich find those? Absolutely. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, um, you know, bread and butter stuff that anybody can do. Anybody can in, invest in real estate. Anybody can, can invest in an Airbnb. Anybody can invest in energy, any energy. Anybody can put solar on the roof. Okay. Everybody can do that. Now, the reality is everybody gets tax incentives. 
They just don't, they're just not thinking about it. You send your kids, kid to college, you get a tax break. You buy a house, you get a tax break, right? You start a business, you get a tax break. You In the US, you adopt a child, you get a tax break, right? You have a child, you get a tax break, right? Australia is the same way. So, you know, you, you, you're well, getting the tax incentives. It's just that you're saying, well, look, my incentives are good and your incentives are bad. And why don't we just say, look, incentives are incentives and you get to choose whether you, I, I kind of think of it as we're all partners with the government, mm -hmm. right? You can be a silent partner or an active partner, but you get to choose. You want to be a silent partner, pay tax. Great. You want to be an active partner, not pay tax. Also great. Yeah. That's a fantastic way of looking at it. You're in partnership with the government. And I also, you know, it might be interesting to track uh, how the adoptions go up after listening to this episode. Right. But <laughs> Uh, during the presidential uh, campaign or uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the presidential campaign, Donald Trump was a guy who was vilified for not paying federal yep. taxes. Uh, if, if you'll remember, there was a viral yep. clip, yep. a debate with Hillary Clinton attacking him for not paying taxes. And he said, that makes me smart. Right. Thoughts on that? Well, I, I, not on that particular line. Um, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the political, but here's what's interesting exactly almost exactly four years later mm -hmm. there's an article in the new york times saying we got a hold of 15 years of donald trump's returns 10 out of 15 years he paid no tax two years he paid 750 dollars of tax and then of course three years he actually paid some serious tax and on top of that he'd gotten a 72 million dollar refund from the government they were fighting over it but that's the refund okay so you know some people would say well that's unfair other people would say well how do i do that Right. And, and I actually look at the, uh, when when that first debate happened, I mean, I had uh, reporters call me all the time. OK, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? What do you think about that? And I'm going, <clears throat> given what Donald Trump does for a living and given the amount of debt he uses, if he pays taxes, he's got the dumbest accountant on earth. That's it. I mean, seriously, it's. It's, it's not because he's smart, it's because he does what the government wants done, okay? He, 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 he builds businesses and, and builds real estate. Government wants that to happen. Therefore, the government gives him incentives. He doesn't pay tax. That $72 million refund came from $400 million he earned on The Apprentice that he put into real estate, got a refund for putting it into real estate. There you go. Anybody Proof. can do it. Yep, exactly what you said, right? They want you to build uh, wealth, right? Uh, yep. Through assets. Interesting. Now, this is all explained in your best selling book, Tax Free Wealth, which is number one in its category a decade later on Amazon. Can you tell readers what to expect when they get that book? Yeah. So it's, um, I like to say it's the rich dad, poor dad of tax because it's kind of a primer. Mm -hmm. Right. Like Rich Dad Poor Dad is a primer on entrepreneurship. Right. Mm -hmm. And tax free wealth is a primer on tax. And it, it doesn't I've, I've had people in Romania. I've had people in Great Britain. I've had people in South Africa say this is a great book, Tom. Yes, I know that you're using the U.S. as example, but it absolutely applies here. I was literally on the stage in South Africa with a South African chartered accountant. And I said, and I took one of my, the strategies from Tax Free Wealth and I, I put it out there and this was um, employing your children. And uh, I turned to the accountant, I said, and she's she's smart, smart woman, good accountant. I turned to her, I said, could you do that in South Africa? And you could just see the light bulbs going on. She goes, well, yeah. And you could tell that she had not thought of that, but you absolutely could do it. So um, it, it's, it's just one of those things. This is kind of, th this was actually written for the average person. This is not, a, not written for your accountant, although I guarantee your accountant should read it. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I've never had an accountant say anything negative about it, not even once. Um, so that's nice, right? Um, it's really meant to be just um, the tax 101, really simple stuff. Uh, I had somebody tell me it was a great beach read. Somebody else told me that it read like a spy novel. I, 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 you have to be pretty nerdy for you to think Tax Free Wealth reads like a spy novel, but I'll take it. Yeah, well, you know, the, uh, as you said, the, the principles are universal. So, um, yeah, if we pick it up, I, I, I know what I'm going to be looking for uh, when I read. I have not, disclaimer, have not read it. I'm looking forward to the new book, which we'll talk about in a moment. But what's it like being the personal accountant and business partner of Robert Kiyosaki? And how did that relationship happen, by the way? I, I love 
love Robert. Robert is, I think, the best financial educator in the world. He simplifies it. Uh, we're on stage together. I mean, literally, we've traveled all over the world together. We're on stage together. And he will literally, we, we have 2,000 people in the audience. And he will say, Tom, that's too complicated. You can't talk about that. And he'll just like yank me, right? And say, here, you go sit down. Let's make it simple. And, and so I've learned so much about uh, how to, you know, how to make things simple, how to keep it simple, how to educate it. And we, you know, we learn from each other. So it's actually been a, a terrific uh, relationship. He's a, a great educator and I, I'm a great student. So it works well together. It, it works great, but we're really, we're just very good friends. I actually met him. Um, I had a business partnership fall apart and my partner took about 40% of the clients. So I had, and all the staff stayed with me. So I had a choice. I could fire half my staff or I could go find more work. And I chose to find more work. And I went and bought a CPA firm. And one of the clients happened to be Robert Kiyosaki. So true story. That's how I met him. Oh, wow. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. I just want to focus on real estate for a moment. A lot of our listeners and subscribers are in that industry. Of course, we own a real estate uh, firm in Canada here. Uh, currently expanding to the United States, but what should agents, agents, real estate agents, we're talking to real estate agents just for a moment, what should they be advising their clients uh, with regards to the purchase or sale of properties and houses? Anything off the top of your head you can think of? Yeah. Yeah. First thing is, is that if it's for personal purposes, the laws are completely different than if it's for rental. And the, the rental, the, the tax benefits for rental properties are enormous. There are some tax benefits for personal. Um, typically, you don't pay tax when you sell the house. You get to deduct your interest up to a certain amount. You know, you might get to deduct some of your taxes, et cetera. Um, but the real incentive is in the business. And so uh, really, uh, the question I'd always ask the my, my client there would be, are you an investor or are you buying this for personal purposes? Because, you know, you, if you're an investor, you need to make sure, okay, have you talked to your accountant about this? Have you got, you know, what, what kind of, are you buying it personally? Are you going to put it in an entity? How are you going to set this up? Um, if you're selling it, do we need to do a like kind exchange, which is that non-taxable exchange that we do here? Um, you know, how much depreciation are you going to get? And uh, both in the U.S. and Canada, you can do cost segregations to get more depreciation. Um, so it really depends so much on, are you an investor? Or are you going to be a homeowner? Because the tax consequences are completely different. Okay. Now, now talking about the real estate, the business of the real estate agent, most of them are sole proprietors, independent contractors. What should they be thinking of when it comes to their own personal real estate business and taxes? <laughs> They're insiders. And my question is, so most real estate agents don't even own their own home. Um, it's fascinating. They don't own any real estate and uh, they're basically salespeople. And I'm going, you actually, especially if you are an owner in your company, in the US, you have an, a, a very two big advantages. One is from a tax standpoint, you're considered a real estate professional, which means that you don't get limits on the amount of real estate losses you can take. And the second is you're an inside investor. In other words, you see these good properties before anybody else. And I'm always amazed because I actually have some pretty big name people that are um, uh, clients of ours or, or in, in my network and uh, that, that have like lots of different real estate agencies. And I'll see people who come in and I'll ask them, so how much real estate are you buying? Well, none. How much tax are you paying? A lot. Okay, well, all right, maybe those two are related to each other. So maybe buy some real estate and don't pay tax, right? Because that's kind of the option and you're the insider. You can't do this in the stock market. You, you, you know, you go to prison for being, you know, right? Insider trading, right? You can't do that. In real estate, you can. It's, a, it's an unregulated market. So why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you investing in real estate? Um, I, I had a, a, a real estate, literally he taught real estate and he tells this story. So it's not, it's not private. He taught real estate. One of his goals in life was to pay a million dollars in tax. And when he told me that I said, wait, 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 no, 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 no. And I said, so I'm looking at your stuff. I'm going, 
you teach a lot about real estate, but I don't see that you're owning a whole lot of real estate. I said, you need to go out and buy some real estate. We literally took his tax bill from a million dollars one year to zero the next. And the result was he had a whole lot of real estate that he didn't have before. So he built his wealth and reduced his tax all at the same time. Wow. Some fantastic thoughts there. I hope everybody's paying attention, taking some notes. So just a question on uh, wealth building, those in commission sales, again, sole proprietors, independent contractors, mm -hmm. uh, what should they be thinking about when it comes to building long-term wealth? Any strategies you can think of? Yeah, a, a couple of things. First of all, uh, they need to be thinking about how they own their business. Okay. Because what type of, uh, whether you own it as a sole proprietorship, whether you own it as a as a, a cor in a corporation. Uh, remember, those are the things that the rich use to reduce their taxes, and you can use those too. So that's that's the first thing: is how am I going to own my business? Um, that's uh, I actually find that the the tax benefits of that can be enormous, and they can be enormous very quickly. Okay, so that's the first thing to be thinking about. The second thing is, okay, what am I going to do with my money? So the first question we ask every um, new client is what are you going to do with your money? And I would tell you that 98% of the time says, I don't know. So what we do is actually, we actually, this is about 15 years ago, we kept getting that answer. And I said, well, then we need to actually develop a way up a, a pattern for them to follow so that they could figure out what to do with their money. And so that's what we call a wealth strategy. And what we do is we look at, okay, how, do I want to be investing in? What do I want to get good at? What do I want to focus on? Because you don't make money by diversifying. Okay. That's the way you keep money. That's not the way you make money. Uh, you, you make money by being specialized. You make a niche will make you rich, right? That's how you make money. So you, what are you going to do? What do you want to do? So we just kind of guide them through that. Once you figure that out, like I was um, before this, before this uh, interview, I was uh, talking to a prospective client um, makes a lot of money. And I, and he asked me, he says, so, you know, what, what do you do from a tax standpoint? He said, I don't know. What do you want to invest in? And he starts telling me his investments. And I go, okay, so we need to look at every single investment, look at what you're doing because we never want the tax tail to wag the investment dog. Okay. So taxes come second, wealth building comes first. And, and you always have to remember that, that is the order to things. So basically there's, there's four things you have to look at. Um, you have to look at the wealth, you have to look at the tax. You also have to look at the asset protection because the minute you start building wealth, you have people who want your money. And so you need to set it up. This is why you need lawyers, okay? So that you can set it up so, so people can't get or you make it hard for them to get the money, right? And then the other thing you have to look at is your legacy. I mean, if you're really going to build a lot of wealth, what are you going to do with it when you die? And you better bring that legacy in early because uh, that's going to have an impact on your tax consequences as well. So we look at all four of those when we look at, um, when, when we're working with a new client. Uh, it's fantastic. I mean, we can't get into all the details there, but great thoughts. I really appreciate that. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, something that, you know, we talk about all the time at our company, which is the Bitcoin uh, crypto yep. blockchain space. Uh, we're a company that does transact in crypto, residential and commercial real estate in cryptocurrency. We've been doing that for a while now. I think we're uh, one of, if not the only brokerage in Canada that does that. Um, but first of all, your your thoughts on the space as a whole, uh, what do we need to be aware of when it comes to crypto and taxes? Like, what don't we know that we should? Any thoughts there? <laughs> well, I think I think we know less than we know. Mm. Okay. Uh, that, that, there's actually a lot, there's a lot more we don't know than what we do know. Uh, what we do know is, is that crypto is property. Okay. So we don't have a lot of guidance. Uh, governments have not given us a lot of guides because they don't know. And so we have to look at kind of the general principles. So once you look at, once you understand the patterns of the tax on the general principles, this is what we talk about in tax-free wealth, is now you can say, okay, well, all right, if this is the general principle, then I can apply that to crypto unless they tell me I can't. So for example, if crypto is property, that means anytime I sell or exchange, okay, that's the key, sell or exchange crypto, I have a taxable transaction. So that means that if I use my Bitcoin to buy a property from you, and then I have sold my Bitcoin. All right. And, and, the, and the value is whatever the value is that I paid for the house, right? Whatever the, the dollar amount is that I paid for the, the, the property. So I need to report that gain or loss on my tax return. I think the most uh, difficult thing for crypto users is, the recognition that 
you don't have to sell it to be taxed on it. You just have to exchange it. And uh, you can't exchange and, and there's there's no non-taxable exchanges, okay? If you exchange Bitcoin for Ethereum, that's a taxable exchange, right? So you have to recognize that. And uh, and I think the tracking is the hardest piece. In, in the US, uh, they're gonna start requiring tracking, I think 2023, they start requiring tracking by the you know river and, and Coinbase and all those people are gonna have to track yeah, the exchanges. Yeah. The exchanges, but for yeah. now you have to track it yourself. Okay, mm -hmm. the, the other thing to recognize is that, okay, what if, think about all these other transactions. So you've got mining, staking, DeFi, okay? So when you look at those different ways that you make money, in crypto, you have to look at, okay, what's the tax consequence? And since there's no rules on it, then what you have to do is, well, there is on mining in the US, but there isn't on any of the other stuff. What you have to look at is, um, okay, so what are the general principles here? Um, so for example, mining versus staking, I always look at, I always look at analogies, right? So mining is really like mining, right? I, if I mine Bitcoin, I've got Bitcoin, and now I have something that nobody else has. I have that Bitcoin, right? And nobody else can have it. So I do have value there. And the IRA, the, in, in the US, the IRS says that's taxable to you. Okay, but what about staking? Well, staking is actually more like a stock split. So in a stock split, do I pay tax? Nope, why not? Because my value is not really increased. I just, we just got more, you know, so I, I staked Ethereum. So, I, so now there's more Ethereum. It's not like I took something that was limited right? Like Bitcoin, Bitcoin's limited, Ethereum's not limited. So now I'm staking. So now do I have tax? And actually there's been a recent court case that indicates that probably not in staking. And so, you know, this is why you have to really understand the general principles. And this is why I think it's so important that people get the basics of how does a tax actually work? Because yeah, you're still going to go to your tax advisor. You're still going to have their help for the details of it. But the reality is I can't change your tax. I can just tell you what you need to do to change your tax. I always, I always like to say, if you want to change your tax, you have to change your facts. But I can't change your facts. My job is to ask you the questions so that I can tell you which facts to change so that you can pay the least amount of tax possible given what you want to do. Yeah, all fantastic thoughts. Uh, you, I, you kind of brought it up, but have you been following the XRP Ripple SEC case uh, at all? Uh, just a little bit, but remind me. Well, I would just uh, whether it's a security or not, and they're, I mean, uh, yes, right. Thoughts on that? So it's an interesting question. You know, um, what is crypto, right? It is, is it a currency? Is it, um, is it a security? What is it? You know, Ethereum actually acts more like a security. Bitcoin acts more like a currency, frankly. Um, and we'll see. We, we know Bitcoin is currency. It's, 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 it's their, it's their base currency. So, um, it, that's a, it's just something to watch, you I know, because Cur currency transactions are very different. You know, currency mm -hmm. has its own rules in the tax law and uh, stock has its own rules in the tax law. So far, at least in the U.S., um, the IRS has treated it more like stock mm -hmm. and currency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the uh, how that plays out, how the dust settles. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, yep. you know, this might not be your your wheelhouse or your wheel right. You're real right. Uh, what are your thoughts on the D the DeFi space? How it'll affect the financial services industry? I, I I love it. You know, I love anything that's decentralized. I love. I here's what I love about um, blockchain. I blockchain's really triple entry accounting, right? That's all it is. It's basically your two entries, and then you have somebody verifying your two entries. And that's why I love everything about blockchain because now you have a transaction that has been audited by every other transaction. You know it's correct, all right? And so um, I think there's just so many positive uses of that. And DeFi is an interesting one. I think DeFi is so interesting because here's an analogy. Let's say that you're, and this is a good real estate analogy. Let's say that you're, um, you're an investor, but you don't know much about real estate, but you have a really good credit score. Okay. And so what you do is you get with somebody else who is really good at real estate, but they have a bad credit score and you use your credit score to buy the property. Basically you're lending your credit score to buy the property. Well, it's a little like DeFi. I mean, you know, there's some DeFi transactions that almost are exactly like that, right? You're basically letting them use your 
Bitcoin as security for this loan. Okay. Well, okay. So you're getting paid for that. What do you, what are you going to get? What are you getting paid? How are you getting paid for that? Um, so it's, uh, I, you know, I think it's fascinating um, stuff, but uh, again, I, I just don't think once you understand the transaction, you can then apply general principles to it and you should be fine. That's fantastic. Are you a new real estate agent or thinking about getting a real estate license? If so, you're gonna to wanna to ask about the Greater Property Group's Agent Scholarship Program. Why pay for the cost of the course yourself when the Greater Property Group will subsidize the cost for you? Make sure you reach out and get all the details on the Greater Property Group's Agent Scholarship Program. Okay, uh, let's talk about the new book for a moment, uh, The Win-Win Strategy, uh, Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. In the book, you do talk about a new level of consciousness for the average person and how you want to enlighten everyone on how tax benefits are incentives, right? They're incentives. Tax laws are incentives. Uh, everyone can take advantage of the tax laws and incentives. Uh, can you unpack that a little bit more uh, for us, what can we expect with the new book? Yeah, yeah. so here's here's one of my favorite parts of the, the new book. Um, and I learned, you know, you always learn more by writing than you do by reading, right? And um, I, I learned some things. Um, what's interesting is I learned, uh, I did a, I actually did an analysis on each incentive as to how much does the government make on this incentive versus how much does the taxpayer make? And uh, interestingly enough, more times than not, the government makes more money than the taxpayer does. So it's a win for the government. So this is a win-win wealth strategy. It's a win for the government. It's a win for the taxpayer. Now, some people are going to say, well, wait a minute, you'd have done that investment otherwise. Well, how do you know that? But it doesn't matter anyway, because here's the other thing. Think about this. So the returns to the government are so good on some of these investments. I mean, some of them, they're off the chart, the returns to the government. And guess what? You can never stop being, you can never buy out the government ever, right? So. I'm looking at these and I'm going, investors are going to look at, at this, at these strategies are going, I want the government's position. I don't want the taxpayer's position. I want the government's position because I get that money forever. I put a little bit of money down now and I get money forever. All right. So, you know, starting a business is a good example or, or solar energy is a good example. But what's interesting is, is that the taxpayer wins too. And so it really is, and, and really the goal here is to change this whole dialogue that, you know, the rich are bad, they're cheating, they're, they're not paying taxes, they need to pay more taxes. I'm going, well, wait a minute though. If this works, you know, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, here's the numbers. You judge whether it works. What I want people to understand is that when, when people are doing things like investing in real estate or investing in solar, right? That, or investing in agriculture, they're doing things the government wants done. And the government says, look, we're going to get part of the return and you're going to get part of the return. I mean, let's take, for example, um, in real estate, you might put $100,000 down and borrow $400,000 from the bank. Well, that $100,000 probably came from your business, right? You, might have, you made that $100,000 from your business. Now, the, the government turns around and says, I'm going to give you a $100,000 deduction for borrowing 400,000 from the bank and, and buying a $500,000 piece of real estate. So effectively they're saying that $100,000 you put into this is tax-free. And what they're really saying is, okay, so you're not gonna have to pay tax. So we're kind of giving up basically 40%, right? Of that 100,000. So we're putting in 40,000, you're putting in 60. But what happens when you actually make money on the real estate? Well, they also take 40%. Right. So they they made an investment, they get a return. You make an investment, you get a return. It's it may be an involuntary partnership on your part. Um, but again, uh, it is what it is. I mean, you know, every everybody remembers the friends episode, right? Where Rachel gets her first check. And she says, Who's this FICA guy? This is totally not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it took all my money. I'm going, well, guess what? That all that's saying is you're a partner with the government. And all I'm saying is choose. You want to be a silent partner. You want to be an active partner. The government actually doesn't care. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the government cares. If you want to be a silent partner, great. Pay your tax. If you want to be an active partner, even better, because the reality is, is here's what happens. Think about this. 
If the government employs somebody, every dollar they spend on that employee, they get a dollar in return, right? That's about the best they can get. They're not going to get much more than a dollar worth of services out of that dollar they spent. But if they do it through an incentive, they might spend a dollar incentivizing you as an entrepreneur and get $10 back. So it's a leverage for them. And tax incentives are a leverage for the government. And, and the, the dialogue I'm, I, I really want people to have is, okay, well, let's talk about this. You can argue whether they're good at, whether the incentives are good or bad, but nobody's arguing. <laughs> What's interesting is, is that outside of Ted Cruz in Texas and Bernie Sanders, Okay, these two are on the same page on one thing. Neither of them like tax incentives, right? Cruz wants a flat tax and uh, Sanders wants a progressive tax, but they don't want any tax incentives. The problem is, is that no other government official wants to give up the power that comes with the tax authority, right? Nobody wants to give up that power. So they wanna say, okay, so President Trump, it was real estate. Okay, now we got President Biden, it's, it's renewable energy. It's the same thing. They just changed the priorities, but the incentives are still there. Yeah, I love the way you explain it, though. It truly is a win-win, you know, voluntary or not. If you, you know, having the right attitude and, and approaching it with the uh, right mindset, like you said, it's a win-win. It's, it works for both parties. So I love that. You also talk about how you can use tax incentives to help pay for your next car, house, or tuition <laughs> bill. In the book. You know you I, explaining I, that? I, so there's actually a chapter in it on how to get the government to pay for your Ferrari. And uh, this, it's, it's a true story. Genius, just, yeah. just to be clear, it's yeah. a true story. The numbers came from, this is a, a friend of mine, a client of mine. They gave me permission to do this. Um, there's a picture actually of he and his wife with their Ferrari. And uh, it actually shows you how to, you know, get the government to pay for your Ferrari. You, the, the government doesn't want you to own Ferraris. They're just willing. They're so willing. If you do what they want you to do, you, there's enough money coming out of it to buy a Ferrari. Well, I, well, my next question was, uh, Tom, will you do my taxes? Well, of course. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Of course. Um, so fantastic. So that comes out July 12th, right? July That's 12th. Yep. But you can pre-order it on our website, winwinwealthstrategy.com. So go ahead and pre-order it and uh, let get, you know, be first off the press. Winwinwealthstrategy.com. Correct. Winwinwealthstrategy.com. Dot com. And that's the, the pre-order July 12th everywhere? Pre-order, 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 pre-order. Just okay. Got yep. it. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap things up uh, with a fun segment. And, and it's fun because at the beginning of this discussion, you actually quoted Albert Einstein, who said, the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax. He said that. He did. Right? So, so you did that quote. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a quote. You got to <laughs> guess. You got to guess who said it. And then the first thought that comes to your mind. Okay. So we'll Go see. Go for it. And this is unfair because I have who said it here and it's okay. totally unfair and I'm kind of probably blow it. So <laughs> go ahead. Well, this one will be easy. This one's good. Read my lips. No new taxes. That would be George H.W. Bush. You nailed it. You nailed it. Okay. And uh, how did that play out? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, he lost the election. Yeah, he lost the election. Okay, good. Here's the, here's, here's the, here's the, Bill Clinton became president. That's how it played out. Hey, you know, uh, here's the next one. I, I like this one. They can't collect legal taxes from illegal money. Do you know who said that? Uh, I, 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 I don't. I, 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 I'm thinking like, um, you know, one of, one of the mobsters, but. Uh, Whoa, Tom, you nailed it. It was Al Capone. So Al Capone, you know, he went to prison on tax fraud, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. How, that's how they caught him. Well, there you go. Al Capone, you nailed it. Uh, we, we had Michael Francis on the show. I don't know if you know who Michael Francis is. He was in uh, Goodfellas. Oh, God. And it. he's the highest earning mob boss since Al Capone. And he actually had a tax scam uh, that made hundreds of millions of dollars. Really interesting story. You should go back and listen to that episode. But that was Al Capone. Okay, here's another one. Okay. You don't pay taxes, they take taxes. Oh, man. Oh, man. That, that sounds like. Um... Comedian. Um, I'm, I'm just going to guess Chris Rock. You're kidding. Tom, Did I get it? Did I you get nailed it? it. How? How are you doing this? It's just the type of thing he would say. Yeah, but Tom, I, I, and for our listeners and subscribers, I did not give Tom these quotes. I promise this is you. This true. I did not I, know this. He, I, that was a total guess. He was, you nailed it. You're three for three, pretty much. Three for three. 
Okay, here's one. I shall never use profanity except in discussing house rent and taxes. W.C. Fields. Mark Twain. Mark Twain. Mark Twain. Okay. Well, that, that, they're the same person, right? I mean, come on. Okay, I got a couple more. Uh, these are fun. Uh, you must pay taxes, but there's no law that says you got to leave a tip. Uh, yeah, I'm out on that one. I mean, that, was, like, that was Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley. There that you go. Morgan Stanley. Okay. I've got, okay. I got two more. This one you might be able to guess just by the way it's said. Okay. We contend that for a nation to try to tax itself into prosperity is like a man standing in a bucket and trying to lift himself up by the handle. Ooh, that sounds like Thomas Jefferson. Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill. Okay, okay. The final one, the final one. This one's my favorite. Okay. This one's my favorite. Who wrote this letter? Dear IRS, I'm writing you to cancel my subscription. Please remove me <laughs> my name from your mailing list. Oh my heavens. I know this one. Um, Snoopy. Tom, I, you nailed it. You absolutely I knew that one. It. <laughs> you absolutely nailed it. Uh, Great work. I, you know, I was thinking, you know, when I, when I had this, I said, we're going to do this segment. There's no way he's going to get even half of these. You almost went a hundred percent. So uh, shout out to Tom Wheelwright. Uh, fantastic interview today. I really appreciate your time. Uh, that breakdown, it was just a clinic and you kept it simple and fun, which I really love. Um, looking forward uh, to the new book. And I want to thank you for your time today. Where can the people find you or where do you want the people to go to, uh, to, where do you want the people to go to uh, follow you, buy your book, go to the website, anything like that? Winwinwealthstrategy.com or um, company is WealthAbility. So uh, WealthAbility.com, it's really simple. If, you know, if there's anything we can do for you, you want us to just take a look at your tax return and see how you're doing, we're happy to do that. We'll do a, a, a free look at anybody's taxes for them.